much, Nikki, and others who've organised today. I can't believe it's just a year ago um, that we were on the road rethinking the system around the North Island on a pilgrimage with no money and connecting with something like 700 people along the way, as well as those who picked us up and posted us um, about sort of radical visions of a values-based um, change process. Um, and I feel like this gathering is really timely. It, we're in a world where, of social change <coughs> movements and activities, where what I sense is a huge desire to act and a massive confusion about how to act. If we look around the world at what appears to be incredible momentum for fundamental change, in Latin America and Southern Europe, radical movements have become governments or popular oppositions. In the UK and USA, people have flocked to anti-establishment leaders within core establishment institutions. Very big circumstances, and I call them circumstances because I think they're too big to call issues, like climate change, the privacy and surveillance capacity of new technology, the global financial crisis, um, and technology and investment-driven unemployment, wars on the boundaries of Europe. These circumstances have massive disruptive implications and have resulted in the mobilisation of many millions of people in direct action and trying to assert um, support for change. In the similarly disruptive period following the 1930s depression and World War II, there were some big organising principles which were based on a widely shared analysis and response and that led in the industrialised West at least to the establishment of welfare states, to the growth and strengthening of unions and other institutions of social democracy. That consensus at that time in response to that massive disruption and change was reflected right through systems from the global le level, such as the rules established by the International Labour Organization, right through the national policies and institutions. Fast forward then to Aotearoa, New Zealand in 2016, and we're in this room, and I hazard a guess that 40 years ago, most of the people who are here today would have been connected to a union, a political party, including possibly a revolutionary political party, a students association, or a strong sort of sustained progressive campaigning organisation like Hart or um, WONAC or All Rands Yet, the pro-choice movements, the campaign for nuclear disarmament and so on. We were all involved 40 years ago, people like us in this room, in lots of meetings, debates, arguments, we produced and sold newspapers, and we had periods of intense activity around elections and social movement campaigns like the Working Women's Charter and the Springbok Tour. And there was a steady flow of thought and action among and between all these organisations. They were all part of a big ecosystem of action and social change. Today, you're much more likely to be connected to a range of individual issues campaigns, a neighbourhood level organisation, or a business improvement group. Your organisation is probably, act probably actively discourages association to or identification with a political party. You might see yourself as being above politics or beyond politics. And you definitely would see any association between your group and the political um, parties or the process of elections um, as being a turn-off for potential participants in your organisation. So, and I, this is my challenge in a sense and where my theory of change comes from, because when you think about it, most social change advocacy is directed at public policy change. And the most direct route to that change is through the programs and elections of political parties into government. And yet that's not how most of us are operating at the moment. I left school in 1982, Auckland Girls Grammar School, it was good to see um, old girls here today, um, as an activist. 
The Peace and Environment Group we've started had campaigned against nuclear weapons. I'd taken notes from my mum to school to release me to attend Springbok tour demonstrations. With a group of young people, we started the first Auckland Youth Council, a totally youth-driven initiative. This was a time when global injustice like apartheid, the Irish question, Palestine, Latin American solidarity, and global threats, most of all, the threat of a nuclear holocaust, drew tens of thousands to the streets and many hundreds to active and life-changing organisation and leadership. It was also a time when a young person, driven by an overwhelming urge to change the world, to save the planet and to make a difference, had a lot of reinforcement. Notwithstanding the general apathy of teenagers, and nothing much changes um, among peers, engaging in change seemed pretty normal, and a lot of normal people seemed to be doing it pretty consistently. There was a smorgasbord of options for making change. In the language of today's conference, a smorgasbord of openly discussed theories of change. Revolution, trade union organising, social democratic parties, mass movement building, creating alternatives outside the system, Māori self-determination. All of these were very visible, had serious followings, produced newspapers, they had premises and they had hardcore dedicated activists. So I joined the Labour Party. Why? Well, I was attracted by people and a program that built on what I saw as our national identity and the work of others, the base of social democracy. At the time, of course, Labour was becoming a battleground between social democracy and neoliberalism. And through that um, period, I settled into the trade union movement where there was a battle for survival about to start. What ensued was the biggest social change agenda of our generation, neoliberalism. And it diverted us from changing the world to saving some of the good stuff that was left in it. And I'm going to ask the question, how did they do this? Because I think that it gives some clues to the theory of change I'm describing today. First of all, what the new right did was that they captured core social change institutions the Labour Party, the public service, notably through Treasury, business institutions like the Employers' Federation and the Manufacturers' Association, and of course the National Party. Secondly, they used disruptive tactics which were not so much aimed initially outside their ecosystem of work and, and action, but at their own institutions. So they formed the New Zealand Party to force the National Party onto a neoliberal track. They established the Business Roundtable, which for many of you, you probably think was always there, but actually it was an enormous challenge to the sort of conventional wisdom at the time among the sort of Keynesian-based um, economic um, organisations of the time. And the Business Roundtable, with its you know, Friedmanite agenda, had tentacles into every established corporate institution. Federated Farmers, the Forestry Association, you name it, every industry organisation came under the influence of the Business Roundtable. They developed a comprehensive narrative, and one which gave precedence to a set of interconnected values. Values which were quite at odds to the kind of humanist values that had underpinned the establishment of social, social democracy, values that elevated things like money, status, competition and so on into the public policy level. And they worked relentlessly hard and at many levels and places. They got into everything. Meanwhile, the radicals, the social activists, we became the new conservatives. We linked dance around hospitals, we fought post office closures and privatisation, we stumbled around as the employment contract sack set out to destroy unions, we organised ACC claimants in the face of massive cuts, 
we successfully stopped the precursor to the TPPA, the Multilateral Agreement on Investment, and we organised successfully against lots of the unpicking um, of the, the sort of social democratic state. In the 35 years since I left school, I focused on two principal ways of making social change. The first is electoral politics, because I believe that if you want to fundamentally change public policy, then you have to change governments, and that means you need to build effective political parties to do it. And the second is trade union organising, because through trade unions you can impact directly in the reality of people's lives, through bargaining and so on, but also build powerful constituencies for broader social change. So finally, in trying to distill a theory of change, from my preferred way of being engaged in change, I've come up with a few things. First of all, ideology matters. And I don't care what we call ideology, I think it's a good word. You might call it a hierarchy of values. It involves a broad social program analysis, a vision. But it needs to give you a framework that allows you to take any issue and know where you stand on it. When I was in the Alliance and in those parties, I always knew what our policy was on an issue. I didn't need to read a manifesto because it came from a core deep set of values and experiences and was linked to a history I understood. I liked Steve Abel's thing about the binary stuff because to me one of the strongest messages I ever heard was you always have to know whether you're on the right side or the wrong side of history. And that's a really good way of making a decision. Secondly, and absolutely critically, you need viable and ongoing institutions. These institutions make your movement legitimate, they contain the collective memory of the movement, and it's where you develop and pass on leadership, and it's a place for your supporters to call home. Thirdly, you need popular support and powerful constituencies. Now that doesn't necessarily mean you have to win the support of a majority of people or even have everybody actively involved. And it, to me it's much more specific the concept of a constituency than a social movement because a constituency is a group of people with common experiences, shared interests and common values. And the left used to be really good at identifying its constituency, the working class was a really good example of a constituency. And I think we've become really bad at it, and the right have been very clear about redefining a constituency which identifies with them. The next thing you need in my theory of change is identifiable and accountable leadership. I think in our social movements now, leadership has become very diffuse and generally unaccountable, and that that's not a good thing for ensuring the development of long-lasting social change institutions. Next, you need real levers to make change happen, and not just good messages to ask for other people to make it. That's why I think, as part of my theory of change, things like parliamentary representation, a la the electoral approach or collective bargaining, a la the trade union approach. These are real levers that really create change. Why wouldn't we want to hold them? Why would we put all our attention into trying to lobby the people who hold the levers to make the change that we want? Um, and finally, I believe that networks are stronger than empires. So just because you believe in institutions doesn't mean there is only one true institution. And I think that networks of in individual institutions are also stronger than networks of individuals. Um, what's wrong with my theory? What would I dispute about it? Well, first of all, um, there's a fundamental problem with the way our democracy works. There's a lot of tension for activists involved in political parties and parliamentary democracy. There's a risk of limiting your vision. I don't think any of those things are inevitable, but the constant vigilance is required. Thank you.